Welcome back to Climbing the Interface Ladder, lecture number two, basic interfaces. So before the break we set up, well, basically a basic interface where we had some different text depending on, well, the type. We had uh, different colors of the text depending on the animal count. We had a button that we could use to disable and enable, which had a text that changed. And we also had some, uh, well, textures being drawn also depending on the type. So we had some uh, dynamic uh, interfaces there. But um, before we'll continue with something else, I'm going to improve this uh, method here. It's not very well, it's not bad really, but uh, basically what's happening now is that we calculate the amount of ambles we have each render tick, each time we try to draw the text, we need to calculate the amount of ambles we have. It's not really that bad, but if we did something that were more advanced, uh, then, well, it's better to just calculate it once in a while, um, so we don't have to calculate it all the time. So, like I said, it's not terribly bad, just because, well, we don't do too heavy calculations here, we loop through three stacks and, you know, just add them all together, but it might be a good thing to take a look on how we can cache this, so basically calculate it and then save that value. So what I'm going to do is move things around a bit. I'm going to start with a um, method here, private uh, void uh, cal... Uh, Type calculate and will count like that. As you see, that has no return value. What I'm going to do is uh, copy this code in here, like so, and um, have a um, a private int integer here, private int and will, and set that to minus one. You'll see in a bit of why. And instead of working with count here, I'm just going to work, work with the anvils. Uh, but before I start, I obviously need to reset it. So when I recalculate something, it might be good to start at zero. Uh, so um, what's, what am I supposed to use this for? Well, I'm going to scrap this code here because I moved the majority of it. And the way I'm going to do the uh, go is that if anvils equals minus one, that's an uh, invalid number. You can't really have negative. Um, negative a negative amount of anvils but well we can it's set to minus one here anyway so if it's equals to minus one then we want to recalculate the amount of anvils we have and in the end we want to return the amount of anvils we do have so if we have calculated it before we'll just return anvils right away if we haven't then um, well if it's equals to minus one then we will calculate it and then just return it so we will always return the amount but if annuals is an invalid one then we're going to calculate it first however this is obviously not going to work because if we change the amount of annuals we do have we have still calculated it in the past but it's not going to be the correct one so how do we fix this well we have a method here on inventory changed um, that we've been calling before but never used and then we can just tell it, well, uh, what's well, equals minus one. So as soon as the inventory changes, then we said, all right, our current uh, animal count might not be the correct one anymore. It might be the same, like we didn't do anything when we changed the inventory, uh, or we didn't change the animal count somehow. Um, so it might still be correct, but we set it to minus one to mark, well, our, you need to recalculate this next time you use it. So this is going to do the exact same thing, but it's just going to calculate it each time that we actually uh, have changed something. Because then we set the animals to minus one, and the next time we need it, we're going to see, all right, animals equals minus one, let's calculate it. So normally we just return the cached value. And um, there you go. Like I said, the old way wasn't terribly bad, but if we would have made something more advanced, then it might have been a good way um, uh, to do something like this, to cache the value. And this is also a bit, little bit of an introduction to something else. We'll see uh, that we will stumble upon something similar to that uh, later on. But that's everything for this for the moment. Let's head back to the GUI here. So, we've seen that we can draw different icons depending on, on some value, like the, uh, uh, the type of this machine here. But how do we do draw things like in the furnace? You know, the embers in the furnace, they sort of uh, disintegrate uh, um, over time, the, the arrow is, uh, the progress arrow is uh, increasing all the time uh, when, when you smell something. So how do you do something like that? How do you animate like that? And like I said before, drawing things, making neat textures, is about drawing rectangles in a smart way. So we're, we're not going to use any methods or anything, but um, we will actually just draw the things in the old way in a new um, 
with the old methods but in a new smart way. So if we take a look here, I had prepared two textures. And the only reason why I have two textures here is well, so we could use the blank one first and then this upgraded one later. If you made a mod, you wouldn't of course include both of these. You would just have machine 2. So what we're going to head over to is go to machine 2 here. So I'm just going to refer to that uh, instead. But obviously normally you would just update your normal machine.png image and add the textures you need. But I'm actually going to take a look, closer look at that machine 2 here. So this is um, a part of it. Uh, there you go. Uh, so this is how it's set up. As you can see, I'm not using all the space. This part here is empty. Uh, I'm currently in Photoshop, but you can use a lot of different um, uh, softwares for um, well image editing. You can use like Paint.net, GIMP, or Photoshop, uh, or anything else if you want to as well. But what we have here is something new here. I have a like a bar here up here. Uh, here's a green version of it and here's a grey version. So to make something dynamic that is moving or changing in size or basically dynamic in some way, what we have here, let me zoom, is this. So I, I place this part here. That means that we're not going to be able to change it. It's always going to be there in the interface. So this is sort of the, the border of it. But then I wanted to dynamically change the, the sort of level of it. And to do so I have this part here. And if we take a look, I'm going to just add a marker here, uh, as you can see this is a selection. And if I move the selection only on here, as you can see it fits perfectly, like that. And that's obviously uh, on purpose. So what we're going to do is draw this texture here, that we have here, inside here. And the reason why I want to do so, and why I haven't added it right away, is because then I can draw maybe just half of it, maybe the whole, maybe just a third, maybe just a pixel. So we can just draw different parts of it to make it different sizes to make basically make a progress sort of bar so it's going to increase and increase um, depending on things like that and that's the whole point with this thing and what we're going to use it for is to show us how big of a percentage of uh, anvils we do have. It might not be the most useful thing to have since we already have the slots to check that right away but it might give us a nice overview of of the uh, amount of uh, animals we do have, and we can see a good example of how we can do progress uh, progress textures or dynamic textures. So sort of like the embers in the uh, in the furnace, or the uh, uh, progress arrow in the furnace, or or anything like those things. So to do so, what we want to do, of course, I changed it to machine two, so we use the correct texture. But after that, what I want to do is calculate how big of the of this should be filled and it's fairly simple we just get the machines not the machines the animals from the machines sorry uh, divide that by the maximum amount of animals that we can have and that's 192 so that's three stacks so 64 times uh, 3 equals 192 but that's not what we want we want we don't care about all right we want to draw like 0 0.8 point uh, not 0 0.8 0 0.835 uh, of the um, of the texture, that's not going to help us. We're working with pixels, so we might want to get an integer of the uh, uh, how high this bar should be in pixels, and that's the important part. That's what we want. But well, how should, do we calculate that? Well, we just get the the parts of it that should be filled times 27. The reason why I use 27 is because the full bar is 27 pixels. If we have the full thing, then we have a 27 pixel high, uh, that green bar there. And uh, that we're going to achieve that, because if fill equals 1, that we have the same amount of animals as the maximum amount, then we will have 1 times 27, and therefore we will have 27 pixels, um, and the full thing will be full. What do we have to do next? Well, if we check if... Uh, uh, sorry if bar height is greater than zero, uh, there's no reason to try to 
uh, draw anything otherwise because then we don't have any pixels at all that we do want to draw. Uh, but then it's just a matter of calculating some things in a smart way. So we don't do anything special really, we just calculate them uh, in a smart way. So the source x, that's easy, that's just uh, x size, just because I put it on the right uh, hand side of the interface. And that's not necessary, that was just something I did to easily define where it was. Um, and then we come to the source y, and here we have not a problem, but we need to think a bit. So where should we get it from? Let's go back into the texture here. So if we want to draw the full thing, we obviously want to start at the top here. But if we don't want to draw just the half of it, do we want to take that part or that part? Well, what we want to do is take the bottom part if we wanted to progre progress from the bottom. I want it to sort of be a meter that fills up rather than a something that goes down. I think that makes much more sense. So I can't just take the top part here. I will have to start halfway down. And if I just have two pixels to go, or three maybe, like this, that's three, um, then I, can, I can't start up here. I will have to st start down here, at that point there. But in the same way, if I want to have a full thing, then I want to start at the very top, uh, very top. All right, th this is everything but one. Then I want to start one pixel from the top. So, how do I do that? Well, with some neat calculations here, we have 27, that's the full thing, minus the bar height. So, if the bar height is 27, we want to start at the top, 27 minus 27 equals 0. That's the very top of the texture. If we just have a, a bar height of 3, then we want to start at 27 minus 3 equals 24, so that's 24 pixels down, which means that we have 3 pixels left to draw, which are the 3 pixels that the bar height was. So, we're just defining these a bit uh, clever, um, and if we do so, if we are a bit smart about where we define things, we're going to get a texture. So as you can see, we're not d d using anything new, because now I'm going to use draw textured model direct. Nothing new, we used that before. But like I said, you need to be a bit smart about where you, what you define things, and if you are, then you can just, oops, I used it wrong here, that's the parameters I want to change. Uh, and if you do so, uh, then, uh, well, you can make a dynamic things like this. So I use 7 here just because the width of the thing is 7, the thing we want to fill in. And now it comes to where do we want to put it. And obviously we want to put it, uh, if we go back to the texture here, we want to put it inside here. And therefore we will have to check where, where, where that is, but I've done that already. And what we want to do here is um, GUI left plus 157. And here we want to go with GUI top plus 40, but that's just the top, so we want to put it differently depend depending on how big it is. And uh, well, what we want to do is add 27 and subtract bar height. And that's just because if we have a bar that if is 5 pixels high, then we want to put those 5 pixels at the bottom, so it's actually increasing upwards, um, like that. So as you can see, um, if we calculate the height of this uh, depending on, on a value, and then we calculate the source y and the, the y position uh, depending on that value, we have basically made something dynamic here. We, we draw different sizes of it, different locations, and from the different a different part of the texture. And now we basically have sort of a progress bar, even though that progress bar is sort of a meter of how many animals we have. It's the same idea. Um, but uh, yeah, basically dynamic thing there. So let's take a look at it in the um, well in Minecraft. Right, and now if you remember, we also fixed that cached version of the anvils, which is pretty good now because we use them in both texture. Um, um, there you go, that's that one. We b use them both in the uh, texture part when we want to draw this meter here. And um, it also is used for the color of this text. So we, uh, if, even though we do it twice in the same tick when we draw it, we don't have to calculate it twice. We don't even, ha even have to ca calculate it once. We've calculated before and it just cast. And as soon as I put something new here, it's going to update. Um, so as you can see, it updated here, and it updated here. Now you can see that green bar there. But if we take even more anvils, um, like that, and put some more in, we will see that it, it increases even further. 
like so. And it's not full yet because we only have 56 here. So it's very easy to see the amount we have here. Whereas here it might be like a bit confusing, like how many do we really have? Alright, 64, 64, oh, right, there was just 56 there. Add on this there, and it's filling up completely like that. So, um, so yeah, and since we cache the value, we don't have to calculate it multiple times. Uh, we just calculate it once. As you can see, it's, it's still updating, and that's because, well, we uh, say that our cached values is old and not a valid one anymore as soon as any of the slots in the inventory do update like that. Right, pretty sweet in my opinion. Um, we will take a further look on the buttons though. What can we do more with them and how easy it is to set up. And to do so, I'm going to add another button down here. And what I want to do is the following. Um, uh, if I can find the code, yep, GUI button, so I want to set up a button here, uh, clear button, so that's going to be used to clear this machine, because at the moment if you place a machine and give it a type, there's no way you can clear it, you can only change the type with a card, but there's no blank card, so you can't set it back to its blank state, so I'm going to have a button here that clears it all together, oh well, it clears the type basically, and um, that equals to new GUI button, like so, and the ID should be 1, GUI left here should be 130, um, then GUI top plus 14, 48, 20, and um, here we go. No, that's the wrong thing. I'm, I'm, I'm reading the wrong line, sorry. What we want here is 130, 14, and here we want 40 and 20, sorry. Um, and finally, we want the text clear. There you go. So th these are obviously just the uh, size and the location of it, and to make that look good, we obviously have to uh, poke around with it, change it a bit, tweak it, uh, you know. And to to get some more space, it's pretty full already uh, the interface. So I'm going to decrease the size and move the other button around a bit. Um, and what I want here is um, 80 instead of 100, and I'm also going to make it smaller. I'm going to make it 48 in width instead. So now these two should. Uh, there should be room for both, actually, so we can have both there. But the reason why I haven't added this yet, as you can see here, I'm using button list of add. The reason why I create a variable here for it is so I can change some things with it first. Clear button dot enabled, so I can actually set if this is uh, enabled or not. And I'm going to do so if the machine dot get block metadata divided by two is not equals to zero. So if this machine has the the type 0, like the blank type, then there's no reason to allow the user to clear it. So therefore I'm going to disable it uh, by not making it enabled. Um, so if it is equal to 0, the type is equal to 0, then it should be disabled. And that's going to mean that even if we click it, it's not going to uh, go all the way here. So the actions performed will not be called uh, just because the button is disabled. So to click it and to get the code, well, this method to be called, it needs to, well, the user needs to click on the button, but it also needs to click on a enable button. So button list dot add clear button like so. There you go. And uh, what we want to do here is, um, well, how do we make sure that this is disabled properly? Well, we're going to do it in a similar way like we did with the button one. So if you click this button, button uh, 1, obviously that's going to um, disable it all. And therefore what we can do is just button.enabled equals false. Because now it's going to get type 0 and therefore, um, you know, it's going to be disabled. But as we will have the same problem that we had here. It's just going to change for our our interface, if someone else had an interface opened, that that person's button will still be uh, enabled and that person can click it. Nothing will happen really, but it can still click it and uh, it will never be enabled again if the type changes by someone else, we will have to reopen our interface. So we still have a bit of, uh, well, a few problems here where it won't work perfectly, but we'll, like I said, we will take a look in the next lecture about how we can solve these things. But since we have set this packet handler up, it's very easy to handle this thing now. Now we can get, just head over to packet, no, not to the packet handler, what am I talking about? To the tile entity, uh, to um, here, to receive button event. So we don't have to bother about the, tile, uh, the packet handler at all. We can just do things here with ID 1. Because, well, the other button obviously had ID 1. Uh, 
like there. So what we want to do here is um, get the metadata. I'm going to call it meta2, like so. Weld arb dot get block metadata. And then it's just a matter of getting it at this specific corner here, like so. And uh, finally, we will do wild uh, object, like so. Set block metadata with notify at a specific coordinate. Uh, that's the wrong thing. And we want 3 to tell it how to update this. But what we want to do here is simply do metadata2 mod2. And what that's going to do is it's just going to remove the type. Because mod2, that's the uh, uh, if it's disabled or not. And if it's disabled or not, it's, well, um, uh, it's what we want still. Uh, the type is going to be a zero because we don't add anything to to this part here. So that's basically going to remove the type but keep if it's disabled or not. So let's take a look on this. Here we go. And um, we will still have some problems with the layout, so it's not going to be perfect. But, uh, yeah. So if I click clear now, as you can see, we have both buttons here. If I click clear, it is cleared. But did you see, see an issue with that? Click clear, nothing updates here. But if I close it and open it again, it's going to update. And um, this is a problem that I wanted to introduce uh, to you. And that is, uh, if we take a look here in the... Uh, uh, GI machine. Um, where is it? Here. We're just getting the uh, metadata of the machine and use it. But if we take a look here, open declaration. So how is this defined? Well, it might look a bit similar to what you've seen before. You know, with the anvils, we cached it and returned it. So if the block metadata is set to minus one, then we want to uh, calculate the value like so and finally we want to return the value so this is a cached version of it on the client side only apparently but the problem we have is for some reason it's not uh, told that the cache value is too old uh, when we're setting it from the interface and I'm not entirely sure why that's that's going on it's just not doing it properly our anvil code is set up properly it's always going to reset when uh, on inventory update or change to whatever it's called um, so that works but for some reason the cache value is not told that it's too old and therefore it will remember what it was uh, just before uh, and it's not going to update un until we do something for instance close the interface and open it up again which is going to be a problem um, so our best solution is actually to ignore this uh, cached value and actually get the proper value. But we can still use the cached value in some instances. For instance here, when we um, create the buttons at the start, because that's only going to happen in the beginning and therefore this value will be a proper one. So what we want to do is just replace this with with getting the actual metadata. So world object dot get block uh, metadata, that's that one, machine dot x code. Uh, machine dot y code and finally machine dot c code like that and you can go away there you go and I also need to do that in uh, where is it uh, hey. so now it should work so that is because we have had a cached value and the cache value didn't really update properly um, so that was the flow I spoke about earlier with the uh, get metadata there. Oh well, yeah, get block metadata because it's not updating it properly if we change it like that. I'm not sure why it doesn't uh, change when we uh, just get it from the interface. So now if we do it, uh, we'll see that it's actually being cleared properly because it's actually using the, the value there properly. So it's a bit unfortunate that, that we can't use it. Uh, like the cached value because that would have been better if it were possible. So look at that, now we have quite a few things here. But I want to do one last thing to the interface and that's going to be 
to draw an icon. So if you actually want to draw an icon um, in the interface, then we can do so. So usually we just draw from a texture, um, and that's the proper thing to do. But in some rare cases, or well, not super rare, but in some cases we might want to draw an icon. And the reason might be that we want to draw like an item in the texture somewhere, like an icon of that. Maybe we want to draw an icon of a, of a block, depending on something. So basically draw an icon that we're using somewhere else already. If we just want a texture, then we obviously put that in our texture sheet. But a specific icon that we use somewhere else, maybe we want to draw that in the, in the interface. So what we need to do is to bind the, that texture and the texture the, that one is using. And uh, well, to do so, uh, we need to do something similar to this. So we need to bind a new texture. And just because we're doing that, it might be a good idea to do it in the end, so we don't have to rebind this texture all the time. Remember, if you bind your texture, that's going to be our current texture until you bind another one. So if we swap back and forth between these things, we have to bind it all the time. So it's easier to just add the code at the end here. So Minecraft dot get Minecraft dot uh, funk, uh, that's the K one there, dot funk, uh, which is it? 110577, that one. And then we need the texture here. But what is the texture of a block or a item, The basically their icon? Well, if we were to refer to something called a texture map, that's basically the thing, one thing that is included in the part of loading icons. What that will do is stitch all the icons together to a texture sheet in the end. So if we refer to the correct texture sheet, then we can refer to the, to the icon. And what we will have to do is refer to one of these two. If we want to get an a, um, icon from the block, then we want to use 75B here. If we want to refer to the other one, we can see this at the very bottom of your, of your screen here, uh, 76C, that's the one for the items. I want to work with the blocks like that, so I'm going to use 75B. There you go. So yeah, this statement is ridiculous. We have funk 110434k and we have funk 110577a and finally field 110575 underscore b so yeah but the only reason why we have so many unnamed things here are because well the way with resource locations are new for 1.6 and that's what we'll have to live with um or will we can contribute the names ourselves if we want to. Um, but what we want to do now is instead of using draw textured model direct, we want to use draw texture model direct from icon. And it works quite a lot the same. We have the size here that we want to draw it as, and that's going to be 16 by 16. I want it in the default size. And then we have the uh, like well location we want to put it at. And I want to put it at uh, 63, uh, 17. You'll see where it's going to be put. And here I want to draw, uh, well basically get the icon itself. And to do so I want the metadata of this uh, block, which is calculated here. So I guess it would make sense to just do like that. So instead of using it right away to calculate the type, what I'm doing is just getting the metadata and then using that. So I take meta divided by 2. Because then I can use that value here without having to calculate it once again. And what I want to do is just blocks dot machine, so that's the machine block itself. I don't have to do it, uh, get get the icon from that, it's just because I thought that would fit. And uh, what I want to do is get icon, you know, um, uh, the method where we give it the side we want it from and the metadata we want it from. And I want the top side, and I think it makes sense to get it from the current metadata, which is of course not necessary at all. We just give it to uh, integers there and it's going to return a value for us. So what I'm getting here is actually the top side well, basically the current top side, I'm, I'm going to draw it in the interface. We will see exactly why when I start it. So let's take a look. <coughs> so as you saw in the code, it was fairly simple to draw an icon. We just had to bind the texture, which was a bit ridiculous with all the unnamed things, and then we had to use another method. But apart from that, it was quite easy. So there you go. It's a bit clustered now. We have uh, quite a lot of things, quite crowded. Uh, but uh, here we go. That's uh, the top. And if I enable it, we'll see the other top there. So depending on the current metadata of this block, we will see the texture here of the top. So we can see 
it stays there right next to the button. Like I said, it's a bit crowded now, exactly, especially if we do it like that. We have tons of things here, but this interface is still quite small. Uh, we can just make it bigger. There's a lot of sp space to do so. Uh, like this interface is bigger than, than this small one. So there's no problem with making it bigger. So when I will continue on this interface next time, what I'm going to do is just make it bigger. But before we, uh, we finish up here, I'm not completely done, even though I'm done with this interface for today, I'm going to take a look on shift clicking. Last time we did made so it didn't crash when it shift clicked, clicked uh, these anvils, but I'm trying to shift click them right now. You can't really see that, but I'm trying to and it won't move. So what I'm going to do now, just before we end, is take a quick look on how we can make it shift click properly. So what we need to do is head over to container machine and um, if you don't remember what we used to disable the shift clicking altogether was that code over there. But what we want to do instead is, um, uh, well, do it properly. So I'm going to, well, we can keep returning all there. Um, and what we want here is get the current slot that the player want to transfer from. And to do so, we can do get a slot like that. There you go. And this ID that we get here, that is a not uh, like these IDs that we send along here. These IDs that we send along here is which item they refer to, whereas this ID here is which slot we have uh, in the uh, well in the in the current container in the interface. So that can refer to different interfaces. Uh, well, different inventories. Sorry, because we usually have different inventories at the same time. So in our our case, what we have is two different inventories. We have our own, the machine's inventory, but we also have the player's inventory with, with all the other items. Um, so we just get the slot there at the ID that we get. Then we want to make sure is that we actually found a slot for just to make sure. Um, like that. But more importantly what we want to do is make sure that the slot uh, oops, sorry. I can't type now. Uh, get has stack. And what this means if is that do this slot have uh, has a stack of like an item stack? Does it contain anything? And as you might remember, the slot itself does not contain anything. What this means is that it asks the slot, um, do do your uh, does your inventory has anything in in your location basically? So when we create a slot anvil, for instance, we give it the inventory here and the index. So if we would ask one of these. Uh, slots if they have something in their inventory or well in, their, uh, in themselves, then what they're going to do is just ask the inventory if they have something at that specific index. So the slots still don't uh, store anything, but they will sort of refer to uh, where they are set up. So if that's the case, that we found a slot that have something in it, what we want to do is get two things. We want to get the content of this slot, and that works exactly the same like what I just described. If we do get stack, we get the stack from the underlying inventory, not the slot itself. And what I also want to store is the results here, which is a copy of the stack itself. Like that. And we're going to use that to return it, so we basically return what we try to move, because the stack itself is going to get um, well, moved away. That's the whole point with shift clicking. Um, and what we need to do now is specify sort of uh, what we want to do depending on on where we are. So what I'm going to check if is uh, if i is greater than or equals to 36. What does this mean? Well, if that's the case, we have 36 player slots, right? We have uh, nine here and 27 here, so that's 36 different slots. Uh, from from ID 0 to 35. The reason why these guys get ID 0 to 35 is because I add them in this order. So I add these first and then I add our slots. That means that 0 to 35 is going to be the player slots, whereas uh, 36, 37 and 38 is going to be our slots. Uh, or Well, not our, all of them are our slots, but our slots that are specific for the machine itself. And therefore, if, if I is 36 or greater, that means that you're trying to shift click from there. And what we want to do then is use this uh, merge item stack stack. Okay, so we can use something called merge item stack, and that's basically going to try to place this stack in a, 
in a specific range of slots. And if you go 0 to 36, what that's going to do is simply uh, put that from 0 to 36. Uh, so it's not going to put it in slot 36, but it's basically from 0 to 35. Um, and if you have false here, it's going to go from, three th yeah, from 0 to 35 rather than from 35 to 0. So we can use that boolean there to specify which order it should go. And then it's going to try to place that somewhere. But if it fails completely and it can't place it anywhere, what we want to do is return. No. So... If it were somewhere in our slots, then what we want to do is just try to place it somewhere in the player's inventory, or if we fail that, then return null. Okay. If that weren't the case, that it weren't any of the last slots, so it actually was in the first 36 slots, any of the player slots, what we want to do is just... Uh, sorry, not that one. We want to merge item stack as well, but in this case we want to do it from 36 all the way to just below 36 plus machine get size inventory like so and falls here as well so if it's in any of the player slots we want to try to place it in any of the uh, uh, machine slots basically and we use merge uh, item stack as well and if we fail that you see that I'm inverting the result then we want to return no. So, so what we do here is not just get uh, a, a result if it actually works or not to do this merge, it's actually going to do the merge as well. So don't be fooled by that we just get a boolean value and then return depending on that. That's not the important part. Well, it sort of is as well, but the important part is actually that merge item stack also is going to do the actual move there. Uh, but we need to do a few uh, last things here and those are the following. So if the stack that, that's the one that we're using when we merge things here. So that's going to be moved away, so therefore its size is going to be decreased. And if, it's, it, if it has been decreased so much that it is zero, then that means that we don't have anything left at all. And if we don't have anything left, what we should do is just empty the slot altogether. Remember, an a item stack without any item in it is not the same as nothing. So we want to set it to null to, so we don't have anything there at all. Or otherwise, we w just want to tell it um, the slot that it just changed, like so. And the reason why we don't do it if the stack was uh, zero is just because it's going to do that for us. So put stack resets the, uh, the um, item stack at that specific uh, index in the inventory, and then tells it that it was updated. And just before we end it here, we want to do slot dot on pick up from slot, and just give it the player and the stack. That's just, yeah, to tell it that some, something was moved from here. And in the end, we return the result. So what we want to do is basically return uh, what we try to remove from there. And if we failed altogether, it's going to return null, which is going to mean that uh, it's not going to try to do the shift click. If we return something, it's going to check uh, from where this is called. It's going to check if... Um, um, what is it going to check? Well, it's going to check if we have something left, sorry. And if, if it does have something left, it's going to see if it can place something more in it. So this is basically how we do it. But I don't know why that's the case, but that is the case. Merge item stack doesn't take into account if a slot is valid or not at a specific location. So now it will actually be able to, we, we will be able to shift click like pieces of stone into the anvil only slots which is a bit of a problem. And what we'll have to do to fix that is actually to, to write uh, our own merge item stack slot, uh, no, not merge item stack slot, our own merge item stack code, sorry, um, to take that into account. Or we can do a little a cheeky, hack, hacky way if we want to. And the only reason we can do this other way is just because we know that all of, the, all of our slots works the same way. If we have slots that work differently, like, all right, this slot accepts these things, this slot accepts these things, it might be a bit more troublesome. But that depends a bit on on how we want it to work. But like I said, we can do it pr quite easily, yes, because we know how that these annual slots work like they do. Uh, block ID. Okay, so what I've set up here is the following. If we try to move something from the, uh, uh, well, from, from our own slots, from the machine slots, then we just try to move them to the player. 
end of story. However, if that wasn't the case, so that the slot we're trying to move it from is actually a player slot, and if we want to move it to our own slot, if the thing we want to move is not an anvil, then we just want to return null right away. Remember, if this uh, evaluates to true, then we're not going to bother about the other part, just because we have an or here. But if it actually was an anvil, what we're going to do is actually try to merge it properly, like so. So that's just a very easy fix. We, we don't even try to do the merge if the item is the wrong type. But of course, if we had like one stack that accepted uh, anvils, one that accepted dam damaged anvils, and one that accepted uh, very damaged anvils, then we would still have a problem because, well, it wouldn't really detect uh, when it tried to do this merge if if things worked properly. So um, so yeah, so, so for now this works fine, but in some more advanced cases it might not be uh, good enough, so we might have to specify it a bit differently. And one option is to create your, your own merge item stack, uh, which is probably the best in the long run, but otherwise you can just tr trick it around with it here with a few different cases depending on the slots and so on. Here we go. So now if I try to shift click, it's going to move down there. If I try to shift click this arrow card, it's not going to go anywhere. But if I try to shift click, click these arrows, arrows, these anvils, they are going to go up there. Uh, like so. So there you go. So it's working properly with shift clicking. And they go where they're supposed to go. But these can't be moved up to there. So there you go. That's about it for today. Let's check a short summary of what we've been talking about. Okay, so we started with just some drawing of text, which is fairly simple. We put that in draw GUI container foreground layer, and then we do font renderer dot draw string. We give it some text, we give it some some coordinates and a color like so. But remember, zero zero in this case is in the very top left of the interface, not the very top left of the screen, which is, is when we draw the background. We could also use draw split ah, draw split string, which we used to, to draw multiple lines in a specific area. When we want to work with buttons, we can do so like this. We put them in, in its GUI, and we need to make sure that we clear the button list, but then we create a new GUI button with a specific ID, location, and size, as well as its text. And finally, we just add that to button list. Then when that is being clicked, if it's, it is enabled, that is, we saw that later on, um, then we're going to be um, uh, running the code inside action performed. The GUI button there, the parameter, will be the button that was clicked. In this case, if it was our button ID, well, the button with ID 0, the disabled button, we just print out click. But as we saw, we had to set up a packet handler to send this, send this packet to the server side if we wanted to do something that wasn't just on the client side. So in the case of disabling the, case of disabling the block um, by changing its um, metadata, then we had to send it to the, to the server side, and then the server would change the metadata uh, um, when, when it received a packet, then we could uh, then we saw some textures here to to get a dynamic uh, well a texture that was dynamically changing uh, depending on the type. For instance, what we had to do is simply just define the source depending on a variable. So in in this case, we got the type from the uh, from the metadata, calculated like so, and then just calculated the source x depending on this type. And we saw in the textures that we had multiple. Um, Icons, well, multiple uh, 20 by 20 texture parts, which were used to be drawn differently depending on the type we had. So we might want to draw an arrow, maybe a border, or maybe the cross, depending on the type we had. We also saw this part, which was quite the same. We want to draw some something dynamically in another way. That was the progress bar, depending on the amount of annuals we had. So first of all, we just calculate the sort of part we want to. Uh, be filled by do machines dot get amas divided by 192 and then we just use that to calculate the height of the thing we want to draw so just filled t 
times the maximum height, which in this case is 27. We use that to define where we get it from, the source y, and also the position to make it work properly. So to make something dynamic like this, a, a boulder here, well not a boulder but a progress bar rather, then what we want to do is just get the size, sources and locations dynamically and that will show this progress texture properly. So when it comes to drawing textures, in the end what we have is well, it's basically just being smart when we drawing when we draw textures. So here we can see a progress depending on the amount of animals we have. We just draw textures. We just draw rectangles from the texture rather, and we just define things in a smart way. So that's the key to uh, making very fancy textures. But it's a very basic element of it. So well how do we know exactly how to draw things? Well, that comes with experience, I guess, but as you can see here, we, we just set it up a bit with some dynamic source, sizes and sources and locations and got that bar working properly. If we, however, want to draw icons, for instance, from uh, well, from the machine block here, we wanted to draw the top of the machine block to see if it was disabled or not, rather than having a specific texture for it. We can do so if we want to. Normally, if we want to draw things, we just add the texture for it, but if we want to draw the icon from a specific uh, item that we already have or something like that, we have to bind its texture and, well, what we used was texture map dot ma uh, ne no, dot field underscore uh, 110575 underscore B, that one is for the blocks, if it's a block icon. If it's an item icon, we want to use field underscore 110576C instead. And then it's just a matter of using draw textured model right from icon instead, and then we give it the location, the icon itself, and the size we want to draw it as. And that's pretty much it for today. We have the question exercise document, of course, that you can do now afterwards. Uh, the questions to see if you have learned anything and the exercises to practice it a bit more. Further explorations if we want to continue it even further. And then we have answers and um, possible solutions to the questions and exercises. So you can check if those are, have been solved correctly. But these are, of course, optional, but are highly recommended uh, for some extra practice. So that's about it. This has been Climbing in the Interface Ladder, lecture number two, Basic Interfaces. I've been VSWE and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you next time. We will talk a bit more about interfaces in the lecture, Customized Interfaces. Goodbye.